So how is this presentation structured? I will go through kind of four fundamental questions. Um, the what, the why, the who, and the how of crowdfunding. Everybody can see all that? Yes. Kind of fine. Okay. So to start, what is this about? So let's try to level the field. So when we talk about crowdfunding, we all are talking about more or less the same thing. And uh, the most obvious uh, starter when it comes to, to crowdfunding is the hype. The hype in the media and, and how is that in very short time this thing has become uh, incredibly important as a word. And one way of looking at when something gains traction in society is by looking at the, when people look for words in Google. So if the searches in Google for a particular word go very fast, you can say, well, there is a trend about people wondering about what is this or wanting to know more. Um, and you can see the world and Denmark and when it starts to pick up. And you can see very clearly that actually before 2010, there was basically nothing in, in the sense of the traction of this word uh, in, in mainstream media. Okay? And then suddenly, from 2012 onwards, very fast, it picks up. Uh, and, and it happens more or less at the same rhythm in the world and here in Denmark. So, so it goes almost uh, without too much of a, of a delay, although you could argue that it starts a bit later, but, but still. And, uh, and there are certain reasons for this, and we will explore some of the reasons why it just became something and, and it, it needed a word, it needed a new word in order to start talking about this thing. Okay. And in terms of where this happened and where is this kind of more of a hot topic, if you look at the world map uh, in terms of cities, uh, cities like Ah, my pronunciation is perhaps not great. U Utrecht? Utrecht? Or how do you say it? Well, whatever. Berlin, Barcelona, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Hamburg, Munich. What do you think do those cities have in common? Uh, this is an interpretation. There is, uh, it is just raw data, and it's up to us to understand why crowdfunding is big in those, in those regions, in those cities. Any, any guess? It's regions or cities with large populations, and then Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of industry and there, uh, there's a lot of initiative in those cities. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, it's also interesting to see that actually it's mainly in Europe and it's kind of a bit not northern, northern Europe, but more in the north and in the south of Europe. And it's yeah, heavily industrialized countries. But something that I realized, and it might be wrong, but it's my interpretation, that it's, it's also cities that are usually associated with uh, some sort of creative industries. If you look at the list, uh, for example, Barcelona, is not that much industrialized, really, but it, it is very, very important in terms of creative industries. And same thing with Berlin. Uh, so, so this gives us some clues directly from the data, the raw data, about what crowdfunding is. And then if we, if we see at the country level, a uh, similar picture, the Netherlands, very big, with Spain, with Germany, Portugal, perhaps a bit of an odd case in this, in this sample, but I mean, it's not a sample, it's actually the population, in fact. Uh, Austria, Switzerland, Belgium. Um, again, in, something interesting is the US is not that much there. Um, and th there might be different reasons why, but again, I think that is, you need high densities of creative industries, and when you look at the map in terms of the US, it's really centralized in New York and San Francisco. Uh, it's nothing in the middle of the US, not really, um, in, in this sense. So, so that's interesting, and for the people here that might have uh, uh, had a look before to think like open innovation, very similar trend, very similar trend. Although, for example, in open innovation, the difference is South Korea marks very, very high, and it doesn't even uh, apply here. Why? It might be because one is most about technology, industrialized technology, and the other one is more about creative issues. Again, this is my interpretation, but I think it kind of makes sense. Um, then uh, we can see how there is a lot of 
uh, media content about crowdfunding, it comes in waves. Because every now and then we see a big project being funded and, and the, for the, uh, breaking records in terms of how many million dollars they manage to crowdfund. So, so every now and then we see the media going wild about uh, crowdfunding. And uh, this thing uh, distorts reality a bit, of course. Because what happens is that in the very beginning, there were only a few crowdfunded initiatives. And they got incredible exposure. And uh, so almost anybody that made some decent campaign will get traction and free press. Now the situation is very, very different. So for people that jump in the wagon of, of crowdfunding, you, you will not have free press as before. But you might think you will because you'd still see the big cases, but the big cases are you know, a drop in the ocean. Um, so just to bear that in mind, because a lot of people get disappointed because they jump and they say, but uh, there are all these cases before, and you know. But, but the, the truth of the fact is that there was a point in time when it was almost a free ride in terms of press, not anymore. Um, and then again, we can see how uh, we have these almost icons of, of crowdfunding changing not only uh, their own companies and creating big companies, but creating industry. So we see how Oculus Rift and, and Glyph, uh, for example, creating an industry of VR that although, yeah, we, we knew existed before, really it's almost like Apple coming in with the iPhone. It creates a smartphone that becomes mainstream as such. And, and it's incredible that tiny, tiny little companies are managing to create these uh, shifts in industries uh, in, in these dimensions. And um, Pebble is this smartwatch. Then the, there is a cautionary tale because they made an incredibly well done campaign. Um, but they were very tiny, so they were copied, copied by Samsung, by Sony, very quickly. Um, so there is a trade-off, and there is nothing to do, really. If you are small, chances are you will be copied, but at least you will have some share of the market that you created. Uh, you are creating an industry, and then <laughs> the share of the industry that you might be able to capitalize might be small, but still, for a small company, very interesting. Another example how... Um, the mix between this cryptocurrency, in particular Bitcoin, and crowdfunding uh, is enabling things that otherwise probably wouldn't have happened, like you know the, the Jamaican team uh, going to Sochi Olympics and, and things like that. So there is a wide range of, of crowdfunding campaigns, and, and some are really business driven, some are fundraising, and we will see all the different kind of spectrums in, the, in this in this crowdfunding scene. And uh, I think something that we need to address in the very beginning is the rationale for crowdfunding. Because there are certain things that are very non-intuitive of crowdfunding. The first thing is how or why would you fund a complete stranger? Uh, especially when a lot of the things that we get online tend to be free and, or we associate as free. So we get a lot of services that really uh, create a lot of value, and we will be willing to pay for them, but we get them for free. And nevertheless, somebody comes online on a platform and say, put $10, $100, whatever, uh, and fund me. So there is something there that, that seems, if we pitched this six years ago, 10 years ago, people will have told us this is impossible. People will not kind of put money into something you know, out of the blue, uh, when they can get a lot of these things for free or simply wait for things to happen. And the answer, or one of the answers for this, is that good crowdfunding campaigns allow us to put our money where our heart is. And, and when society becomes so big, um, it becomes very depersonalized. And your possibilities to, or your how you feel about the possibility to create change in the world, um, it, it actually goes down. And these things kind of make you feel like you can create realities. If you believe in a project, you can be behind that project. And you can be part of a community that is making that project happen. So, so that's kind of one of the keys to unlock 
crowdfunding. And when it's well done, it's a lot about emotions. And when you see the videos of the typical crowdfunding um, projects, a lot of times they are very emotional. And they are very well crafted to, to trigger these emotions. So it's not just about, you know, I have this incredible business proposition, it's just such a good deal, put the money. Because we have a lot of these deals already. We have them in supermarkets, we have them everywhere. We don't want that. We want something more because there is a trade-off here. There is a trust level that you need to have in order to participate in any crowdfunding kind of campaign of putting your money. And, and to buy the trust is not with an extremely good deal because, in fact, that could sound almost dodgy. Uh, it is uh, how to buy your trust is buy it through your heart and make, it, make you believe that it's true, that it's reality. Uh, that the project can happen or if it doesn't happen it's not because you know there was a fraud or it was just business driven but because they did the best and, and it didn't really work out and uh, this is reflected in Kickstarter original rules these rules have morphed in time but the very first rules of, of Kickstarter and to a great extent other platforms uh, had these sort of things it was to fund creative art it shouldn't be just charity. It should be for a project that was pushing boundaries somehow and, and creating new value, but not in the traditional charity sort of thing. Um, that's kind of another game. And uh, that something that was important was to declare the amount that they needed, be very transparent in that we need this because we want to do that, and, and set a deadline. So it was a lot about targets. It's almost like a game, you know, like any video game, you need to have this thing very well crafted too. So the objectives and some sort of a scoring system, uh, is scoring in the sense that, okay, you see money going up and you see the speed in which this thing goes and you see community developing around the project. This was key. And then this morphed and evolved to allow projects that were less into the creative arts and that had more of a spectrum. But it started into that because it was the most logical way of relating this trust uh, issue that, that, or solving this trust issue that I, I was just commenting before. So the bottom line is that we, in, in this kind of a strange world of crowdfunding, we create the feeling of ownership without expecting property. So people feel that they are part of this community. They feel that they own the project. But it's not really because they own necessarily equity. It can happen. And, and we will see the spectrum. But originally, and, and the things that tend to do very well, this is one of the things. That they create ownership without property. And they create new realities. They make something in the market that otherwise wouldn't have happened. Uh, the pedal or the, the VR kind of headsets and all these things, they were a bit too wild for the normal company to come uh, with them. And also, it is uh, related with this patronage and this idea space community. It's not just about somebody coming with an idea that is their own idea and they just know how to solve it. They usually, the ones that do very well, they pitch an idea and they develop the idea with the community. And they allow people to comment and to provide feedback that potentially can get into the product. So it's very different to Sony creating a smartwatch. And, and this also enables a community to, to be more engaged. And uh, very briefly, history, because I think it's important to understand how we got here. Um, so. There are several things. Uh, one way of, of looking at this could be through the lenses of how funding in general has uh, evolved and, and how we went from very centralized um, funding structures, well, in fact, originally decentralized and centralized in the banks, and then these kind of middle grounds where the community was able to fund projects. And uh, one of the kind of uh, child uh, examples of this is the Granite Bank with uh, Junos, where you can see 
this idea of putting a small, a small lumps of money, trusting people in a way that actually disintermediate banks. And, and this kind of set some ideas about, well, we can experiment with funding. It was not really in that sense, or in the sense that we understand now, proper crowdfunding, but it was experimenting with different funding alternatives. Um, and then this started to be a bit more, you can say, professionalized or, or and using online platforms. And something that really made a difference is this one that is here, Kiva. And, and Kiva basically created a platform online that allow you to peer-to-peer -peer lending, which is basically we can lend between ourselves money without going through the bank at a certain interest rate if there is an interest rate that applies. And, and you can select who you fund with your money instead of putting the money as savings in your bank. It's not, again, the crowdfunding that we tend to associate with things like Kickstarter, uh, because it's not about changing the world in terms of a product that will go out there, but it's a mix between almost charity, but it's, it's more about creation of community through the embeddedness of, of these new ways of funding. And, and this show, it was a demonstration that these sort of things could work. And in fact, the, the, um, the default rate on the credits in this platform has been consistently very low. So this created the idea that we can have trust in these platforms that relate with money and stuff. And, and that was, was quite interesting. And then uh, in 2008 and 2009 appears in the Gogo and Kickstarter and they take some of the learning points from all these other experiments and they put it together in this particular format that is a bit more prone for businesses that can scale very disruptive, potentially disruptive industries. Although they started with creative arts, uh, they, they, there was this seed about something that could create very important changes in, in terms of markets. And then quickly after that, 2011, 2012, we see how uh, regulation starts to evolve and countries start to think, well, this is for real because there are projects that are able to get so, so much money, and, and in ways that were thought to be impossible before. All these projects were too green to go to angel investors even, not, not even to imagine a bank or, or any other uh, traditional funding scheme. So they opened the door in this green space of, of very early funding that, that tends to be too risky for others to take. And then you can see more or less what we were talking just before, microfinance, microlending, peer-to-peer lending, and then crowdfunding. It's not linear, it's not a linear story. There was a lot of cross-fertilization, but more or less we, we can see this sort of, this sort of uh, thing. And, well, just one point here. Kiva was a bit more about, um, yeah, it was more social and, and more charity-driven, while SOPA, very similar idea, the, the I lend you money and, and so on. Um, it was more commercial, it was the, the, the interest rate was very important and the idea was that you could actually put your money there and make some profit. Just, just. So what is important to remember is that these ideas of crowdfunding and, and, and all the different spectrums have been always present, but at different scales and, and through different means. And, and we saw before some of kind of the, the more newer cases, but then you can think, historically, we have had patronage in different forms, people kind of just sponsoring people to do creative projects and art, uh, taxes, it's almost like crowdfunding, but forced um, to, to a great extent. Um, all this idea of, of the sponsorships, of athletes, or, or whatever, and, and the charities. Um, in fact, there is something interesting in what can happen in terms of the evolution also of these, all the structures, because there has been a lot of discussions too about, for example, if taxes is almost like a forced crowdfunding scheme, why don't we actually make it more of a crowdfunding? So if there is a need in society, uh, why don't we allocate the funds in a more competitive way? So there are, there are also some experimentation about how to, how to play with these new rules in, in, in a context that, that 
perhaps a Laozi. Um, yeah. Do you have any concrete examples of that? Well, there are a different hybrids. So, for example, in Latin America, where, where I come from, there are examples of um, crowdfunding for roads. Mm -hmm. So, you will be able to get funding from the government if you put, if you crowdfund your stats, at least a portion of the road. And same with public spaces. It's kind of a hybrid, but it shows you in a competitive way uh, because it, it pushes you, it says to the community, we cannot do everything, mm -hmm. uh, but if you manage to put together some strength into a certain direction, we will cover the other side. Because it, it, it adds a really interesting dimension to what is public goods and what is private, and that that's in between there, it's, it's really interesting to how you can actually do ownership of, of the public goods with, with the private thing. And mm -hmm. that's, that's something I think that crowdfunding is really good at. That is to create that form of ownership in uh, of an idea of somebody else's business, um, maybe in public. But it's just I haven't seen it in public yet. To, yeah, to, I to think that work. it doesn't happen so much in wealthy countries. Yeah, because at least not in Denmark right? because here we yeah. here, here we neglect our uh, public goods uh, a lot. Yeah, well, it might be that you have uh, some basics also solved, and there is enough taxes to move around. You know. And the prioritization happens more at the political level, but but I think it, it is interesting to to explore how these things can change society in other in ways unexpected by the people that was starting with with all this. And one of the drivers or some of the enablers are basically things like well now we have the technology to make this thing happen at a scale, so we can disintermediate institutions like banks or even governments for the sake of it, uh, and, and the skills can be much bigger than before. Uh, and ultimately, this leads to somehow the de institutionalization So people can, can go straight um, and, and take avenues that otherwise won't be open. Um, I won't go in detail here, but just to show you, and, and you will have this presentation uh, as, just as, as it is here. It is, in fact, online already. Um, so you can see that there are 450, at least by the end of 2012, crowdfunding platform. A lot of them died over that period too, and a lot of new ones emerged. Just to show you, some uh, from nothing, from having zero, now we have a lot of different crowdfunding platforms, sometimes very niche. So you can see a crowdfunding platform that specializes only on software development. Crowdfunding platform only on very creative arts, super niche and, and so on. And, and you could argue there might be a saturation in terms of the amount of platforms we can have because also there is a matter of trust. There is a, a complication here. Kickstarter, Indiegogo, they, they manage to have such a big chunk of the market of these platforms because people trust in them. If you create your own crowdfunding platform, you need to create some sort of trust behind it. And that's pretty difficult because you are intermediating money. So, so it's a figure that is tricky, and, and there's still some, yeah? Is there a place you can browse those 450? Uh, I think I, I got this from, from a place that had these different platforms. Yeah, I, to be honest, I think the shortest way will be to Google. Well, it, Wikipedia has an article. Yeah, yeah. Wikipedia has an article of, of, on crowdfunding platforms that lists and have, I don't know, if all these hundreds, but a lot. And, uh, and then you can see all these different niche platforms. But I will be very careful on using the very small new ones because you don't know to what extent they have the financial backup. And obviously, they gain money. They, they charge a percentage of the transaction fee. And there have been, and, and it's good that you pointed out, uh, and I didn't have this in the presentation, but there have been, for example, a lot of issues with PayPal and crowdfunding because PayPal is an enabler of crowdfunding, a pretty big one. But also PayPal can be really difficult when it comes to freeing funds because they are worried about fraud and they have a lot of things to, to, to be concerned about and, and these issues between countries because you sometimes have the PayPal account in the US with the US dollars and you're working in Denmark and it creates issues when you're funding something that gathers millions of dollars and then you cannot take them out because PayPal you know, doesn't let you. It is pretty tricky. 
and, and it's something you, you need to consider, and, and that's why a small platform might be even more difficult. Uh, if, if any of you is, is interested in this detail, I will definitely uh, recommend you that you Google these stories about uh, PayPal and, and Kickstarter, for example, because it is something that, that can lock a lot of money in, and if you are serious about going into you need to prepare yourself before, because otherwise you might have a successful campaign that later on cannot really send the stuff to be built in China because you cannot pay the supplier or whatever. It's pretty tricky. Um, yeah, here there are some, some success rates, uh, uh, stats. Um, probably you can read some of them later in the uh, online. What I, I want definitely to get to the part that is a bit more interactive because I want to show you examples and stuff. Current enablers, uh, we already discussed about things like, like PayPal. All these, these transaction platforms that actually it's kind of a platform connected with a platform connected with a platform because uh, Kickstarter is nothing without something like PayPal. And, and PayPal is nothing if it cannot connect with credit cards and so on. So it's kind of a very uh, complex link of platforms and somehow Bitcoin, if it really works, as a proper currency in the mainstream, you could think that it will facilitate this because you don't need to have all these layers of credit cards and PayPal and so on. It will be a bit, in theory, easier, but we will see about that. Um, hardware is, is interesting how 3D printing, 3D prototyping, uh, agile uh, prototyping techniques really enable this creative project. Because if you want to have something in Kickstarter, let's say, you need to show it working. You need to show that uh, and, and have a lot of iterations early on to show the potential. Before it was pretty tricky to do this to a quality level that was decent with, with little money. Now you can 3D print the stuff, um, have a model that looks almost like the final product and say, you know what, I need money to make this thing and scale in China. And, you know, the only way to really make it to, to sell for $20 a piece is to have a million of this done. So that's why I need your money to fund the whole thing. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of things related with regulation uh, that, that are both enablers or barriers. Uh, they are kind of in, in very fluid at the moment. All this thing about access to knowledge, open source, open design is, is opening also access to, to entrepreneurs that otherwise won't have the tools to really just download a 3D model and modify it for free and you know all, all this related with agile manufacturing but another part. Um, and, and the need for more agile, earlier and smarter sources of funding uh, that push this platform to be created. So it kind of push and pull phenomena. And we talk about some of these success stories before uh, just to give you a visual idea of, of what we were talking about, the Pebble and the uh, Oculus Rift. And so in, in crowdfunding, we have two things, the crowd and the funding. In the crowd side, it's really in a spectrum. It's easy to think that it's just a highly distributed group of strangers and it's a mass that we cannot really control and it's almost magic. They will somehow get into the website and start putting money in. I have seen projects with that approach and it's terribly, like, it goes terribly wrong. Because you, you think that because there are so many people, even if the 0.0001% get to see your stuff and even a fraction of them put money, you're millionaire. But it doesn't work like that. And, and there is a network phenomena of, of how you build communities. And you need to build, in the beginning, a small but very strategic community that will make the, the content viral. And you need to be very clever about how you do this. Um, it, it means that you need to have people in different geographies that, that will viralize the message. It means that you need to have people that is connected with different communities of people. So they, typical case is that you say, yeah, but I have a hundred friends. That they are all my very tight connected friends and they will viralize. But then when the hundred send the message, almost 90% of the message goes back to the hundred because it's such a close knit community. It needs to be a sparse community so the message can get far beyond the borders of what is your own community. And this, this is a message in general for, for anything that you want to make viral. 
And in terms of the funding side, this is, this is a bit what we were, uh, or what I was saying before in terms of the spectrum. So if, if you try to think on, on a way of looking at this fluffy idea of crowdfunding, you have uh, two axes. One axis is the vertical one. You can think about projects or, or schemes that have different levels of uncertainty in the return from the point of view of, of the backer, the, the, the person that will fund. High up, things are very, very, very uncertain in terms of the returns that you will get as a funder, somebody that put money. And, and this will be on the, um, okay, that's, that's one axis. And the other axis is, how is this thing driven? Is it driven because it's a lot of passion? Or is it driven because you want profit? And if you combine these two axes, you can see that if it is very uncertain return, but is passion driven, things that are more related with uh, fundraising or just help social causes kind of make sense because you don't really know the impact of your money. You just trust, but then you have passion. And that will be fundraising. On uh, the other extreme, uh, on the left uh, top corner, we have things that are very uncertain in the return, but are profit driven. So you are buying equity in a company that you have no idea so early on. You have no idea how it will go. Um, going down uh, in uh, profit driven and low uncertainty, you can say like, for example, a loan in some of these websites. The, the actual the return rate is, is known and, and most people actually pay the loan, so it is easy to, to put it in that box. And then the low uncertainty in the return, but passion driven things like Kickstarter and Indigo. Now we can discuss the uncertainty in the return because effectively a lot of these projects don't actually happen. But there are some mechanisms that this platform create to, uh, to reduce the risk. So for example, if you put $100 and the goal is not achieved, your $100 go back to you or are never charged. Um, Usually what happens is that you get the product somehow, but the quality might not be what you expected or it might be a bit late. But for the most part, the uncertainty is somehow controlled, especially in the big platforms. And uh, the question of why should we care about it, does it affect us? Well, it depends in which situation we are, of course, but in thinking from, from three key point of views, as an investor, crowdfunding enables us to have an early test of the company's capabilities. So even if we don't participate in, uh, in, in the crowdfunding kind of campaign, we can monitor all these things and say, okay, here's a company that I, I, I will follow because it looks like it's getting really interesting, or even just the industry. They are creating something that seems that it will exploit and I might not fund them, but I might fund that their competitors or I know where to allocate uh, money. Um, so, so in general, I allow you to have a better understanding of ma the market responses to new product categories. And it's kind of an interesting secondary effect of crowdfunding. As a com consumer, it really brings us new and bold products, products that otherwise might not have happened. And, and it's almost like a very important piece in an innovation ecosystem. It's a new piece, and, and I think it's a, quite an important one. Um, and also, as consumers, allow us to intervene in the design process. So we can give early feedback. We might be able to actually change the product shape, function, whatever, um, and, and better match the needs with the, with the actual product. And, and the products and services get, finally, faster to the market. As an entrepreneur, or, or even an intrapreneur, because if you are inside of a company uh, and you want to push an idea, even if it is a big company, you might try some scheme of crowdfunding. This is a bit tricky in the sense that it has been the case that the community doesn't accept too well when you go to a platform like Kickstarter and it's a big company behind. Because the, com the, the community say, well, these guys should pay it themselves. So, but if it is a small company, but it's still a company already, this, this can work. It's, 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 it's a good alternative to fund uh, more wilder projects in the company. Um, 
it increases agility and pivoting. So basically, if you are working through through crowdfunding in a company, it allows you to test. And if the campaign doesn't work, you at least, and, and you did it properly, is because the product didn't have a future. You didn't actually have to go to the market in, in the traditional sense. You tried to the campaign, didn't work well, you can iterate, change it, whatever, without the full risk. So, so you can go very early, and, and it's a free marketing source too, because obviously uh, if you do a, a good campaign and it becomes viral, it's much better than paying for an ad anywhere, really. Um, and uh, this creates new challenges. Ready uh, explain uh, this idea of the visibility in the beginning. You were highly visible if you did crowdfunding, now you are one more. And, and you need to accept that and, and try to play around that. There have been frauds, uh, and especially in this smaller platform, but even in the big ones, uh, and, and uh, it happens in different ways. So on, on one hand, the guy behind the campaign might be generating a fraud, but there might be uh, uh, suppliers that get involved. And, hey, you, you need to cover yourself as it would be in any normal company, really. But it's the problem is a lot of people get into this thing and things happen so fast that they don't even have time to reflect. The, the pace of these things is, is way too too fast. And, and another challenge is this early exposure of the ideas to the market that creates a challenge to intellectual property. Because you might not have the money to patent at the point that you go uh, and you make your video and all that. You might not have really the... The, the technical issue results, so you cannot patent anyway. Uh, then you get the money to, to, to do the actual R&D, and when you want to patent, you see that the big company went ahead and you know closed an option. So it is it's not, not, not a free ride, and, and uh, you need to see how much is the risk of showing it to the world versus the risk of being, uh, uh, and the risk of being copied. My take in general is that the chances that because you're showing your stuff to the world, you're copied versus that because you show your stuff to the world, you, be, you are successful, the, the, the latter is more likely to happen because there are too many ideas in the market and the problem tends to be implementation. So people get too afraid about being copied, but they don't realize that their idea is not that valuable as an idea. It's only valuable with the implementation and not many people can implement it. I don't know if you have any anything to add there, but I have seen this especially when when I have worked with with a startup. They get so concerned about pitching their their product or their service, and they don't realize that really until they, they do it for real, uh, the best thing they can do is just to try to see people's um, reaction and, and get feedback. And and who will be affected? Uh, uh, well. As we said before, a lot of things get affected in, in the society, but for sure banks will probably be hit at one point um, by this. Investors will have to reshape the way in which they, they do invest, because effectively this is taking part of the market in investment, especially early investment funds. Um, the, the legislators, they need to take notice. And big companies, because we are seeing now how small companies can get into the markets of big companies and get the funding, get million dollars or more uh, to do something that before the, camp the big company was not uh, afraid because the money was the barrier for, for their own market. And how do we know when it makes sense? What, what I would like to offer is a, is a way of looking at the... Uh, business model canvas through the eyes of crowdfunding. And how many of you have used the business model canvas in any shape or form? Okay, so again, kind of how. Um, it is a very good tool to just put in words and, and in a very graphical manner your, your business. Um, but we can also use it to try to understand how to align all these things when it comes to crowdfunding. So, if you, if you look at this, uh, we can start from anywhere, but if, if we look uh, from the center, 
the value proposition for something that is uh, meant to go the crowdfunding way, you want something that is truly no novel and therefore risky. If it is something that uh, is not risky, people might not have an incentive to fund you because they will not uh, see the pleasure of seeing something novel in the market by funding you. Uh, there, there won't be that, that incentive. So, so novelty or, or something that can really make profound changes um, is something that probably is important in the value proposition of a crowdfunding uh, effort or, or, or whatever kind. In terms of the customer relationship over there, as we saw before, probably there is some element of, of passion driven and, and allowing some co-design, some element of the user driven innovation or, or user participation in the process. Um, the customers, if you try to go to a very mainstream massive market straight into, you might find it really difficult because it's like averages. If, uh, you know, Kraft or Unilever, they are very good at mainstream uh, consumers they, because they, they just have the machine and, and they, they like the average uh, customer. They can approach it. For a small startup to trigger passion, to trigger user uh, participation, it needs to be a community that can be actionable, that, that will react and, and will engage. And that usually means a niche community. A niche community that hopefully is global. So it might be, you know, a very small percentage of the population in Denmark. But when you add up in, in the world, uh, it might be a really interesting market. But, but it will be fragmented, it will be difficult to identify. And this is why also something the key for success is that the entrepreneur knows very well this niche community. So uh, if uh, you are trying to promote your service to hipsters, hopefully even a uh, niche inside of the hipsters somehow, um, you should be one of them. You should understand them. If you don't, uh, the chances of really viralizing this thing will be low. Um, revenue, it should be highly scalable because you, the whole point is that this thing can be a hit. It might not be. So you need, you need to be able to scale it down. But you need to be able to scale it up. And this is why, from the first moment, you need to say, "Okay, I can manufacture it myself if, you know, or, or in a small setting in, in in the country, if if it doesn't go that well. But I can easily pick up the thing and manufacture it in China or in India, whatever. Uh, and in that sense, it's scalable. Channels. If you use a platform that is online and your customers relate with you online, hopefully the channel also is somehow <coughs> online." Or at least it's a very cheap global distribution. If you're selling a big piece of metal that is impossible to cheap uh, at a decent price and only need to be picked up in the location, it's pretty rubbish for crowdfunding for the most part. Um, the key resources probably will be something like people and, and the platforms that you create. Um, in terms of costs, this is, this is interesting. There are lots of ways of framing in a startup and, and you can play with different combinations of fixed costs and variable costs. Um, usually in crowdfunding you will want that things are... If you, if you want very big scales, you want that you have one fixed cost that might be your salaries and whatever, the people around. And then the variable cost is small because you can sell a million or, you know, and, and the fixed cost will be nothing. So, so there is a combination, but it, again, it depends the scale. So if you just have 100 units that you want to sell, then, then it's different. But it's, it's important to, to bear in mind this in combination with the scalability. In terms of key partners, um, usually will be somehow distributed because the key partners will be the core community that helps you to viralize the crowdfunding campaign to a big extent. Uh, and and, and uh, so you need to incorporate them in the whole process. Almost they are part of the company to a, to a point. And one of the key activities will be outreach, getting out there with a message, having <coughs> unbelievably good media uh, outreach and videos and, and so on. Because this this will be, you are selling a campaign. You are not even selling a product at this stage. You are selling a video that needs to involve people emotionally. 
I, I think it would be interesting if you have any questions in this particular side, and if you can see your projects fitting, or any of the ones that have a company, fitting this combination of things. This is it's not an easy combination. It's, it's, it doesn't happen always, and this is why not all projects can go crowdfunding way. But if you have something that has the right combination, it would be interesting to hear about it. Hmm? I have a question. Would you say that this is for crowdfunding, or would it also be the same for equity crowdfunding? Well, the thing is, this is a good question, and most of this is thought in the almost Kickstarter campaign sort of thing. But there is there is an issue. To be sexy in the equity funding world, you want to have similar characteristics. Because it's almost like to go equity funding, if you are not solid enough to have a good crowdfunding campaign, it is difficult also to involve uh, equity funding. It's, it's not too different in uh, in reality. I mean, th there might be some... There, there are a few limits. Yeah. There, there, are, there are a few main, main differences. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tap a little bit into it later, but it's especially in the post-investment space where the reward-based uh, crowdfunding mm -hmm. is more like, do I get my product that I signed up for? And whereas in the equity space, then you have to gotta have investor relations strategies in place because you're you're signed up with these guys. You you have key partners now, um, so so that community engagement it sort of like bridges into the post-investment experience. Mm -hmm. And you will be evaluated on that, like on a consistent basis and, and continuously. Um, so, so your performance and and all your promises. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's correct. And also, we need to separate. This is how you frame the business model of your company, not how you do the crowdfunding campaign. Yeah. Um, there, there are some different. So, let's say um, all all the scenarios that can happen. If you have a technology that is unbelievable, that comes from a lab and, uh, you know, it has this issue with intellectual property, it is a bit tricky, uh, but you know almost for sure that it is very, very interesting for, for uh, funders that go a bit more with more money like equity funding, then you might want to avoid crowdfunding because you know it's a, it's a super good uh, funding opportunity as a company. You might also mix them. Um, so it is, yeah, it is, but I will argue that actually in proportion, most of the projects of the startups coming from, you know, bottom-up startups, normal people coming with businesses, to, to fit in the crowdfunding bucket is difficult. I mean, you need to have a lot of combination, but it's not impossible. To fit in the equity funding bucket probably is even more difficult because you need to, to be interesting for people that is even more picky. And also it's more expensive to run because equity involves more regulation. So it's not just something. To finish, and, and then we can have more questions if you want. Um, this is a, a, a paper really recent um, from the beginning of this year that tried to understand in the context of, I think it was Kickstarter, um, what are the characteristics of this project? So take a large sample and analyze what happened. And uh, in what it found, which I think is interesting, is that the vast majority of projects do fulfill their obligations, which is perhaps unintuitive. You will think that a lot fail, but uh, the ones that are funded, they tend to fulfill their obligations. But for, at the same time, they 75% delivered later than expected because they are new to the market. They have no idea how to manage supply chain. And it's very easy to underestimate how difficult it is to actually do proper supply chain. Uh, then uh, it, it highlights the important role of network, what we were talking before. It's, it's not just a crowd of individuals kind of uh, fragmented. It's about the network and how you approach this network strategically, and, and geography is very relevant. So. We saw in the very beginning that there were some hot spots in the world where crowdfunding was big. That's one side, but the other side is that if you want to be big in crowdfunding and you are based on a city in the middle of nowhere, 
very disconnected, the, to create your network, it will be complicated. Uh, so places like Copenhagen are, are good places because they are they manage to attract people from very diverse uh, places in, in the world. So the viralization factor of your project will be better. Uh, and, and the fact that here English is widely spoken and, and other things also helps. Of course. That's uh, what I had prepared. Um, if you have any any questions, happy to to go through. <laughs>